data teams are like architects, constructing bridges between information, insights, and ultimately success. Today, we're joined by master builder Lewis to reveal the secrets of what makes a data champion successful. Now, prepare to be awestruck and join me, Ross Webb, and our guest, Lewis, the visionary VP of data at Pension B, who built a data powerhouse and he's about to reveal his secrets. Your path to data leadership success starts right here, right now, on Data Team Success, brought to you in partnership with Amplitude. Now, coming up on this episode, the 720-10 rule, data teams reimagined. Supercharge your data career. Level up your data team management skills. Now, today we're joined by Lewis. You know, as I've mentioned, he's the VP of data at Pension B, and he's been at the forefront of data innovation, and he has proven strategies to create data teams that can simply be called champions in the industry. Now, the first thing I wanted to know more about is your experience in making a company data-driven by creating data champions. Specifically, what other data leaders can implement to help overcome productivity challenges without having to just say scale up the entire data team what do you think one of the key things uh, that i identify and which has helped me to push this data champion function is that every area within this business is very data driven and the people working there is very keen to put their like use their hands get their hands into the data and do their own analysis right so or a way to like mitigate the dependencies and like uh, and the um, and the capacity of the, uh, like the capacity constraints of the team was to create this role called the data champions that uh, would be assigned to a member of each one of the areas that was eager to like get a bit of the technical skills to do the data analysis and act as a champion for their team to be able to, um, you know, like get their data requirements solved in, a, in an easier way, right? So um, this has been very su successful through like uh, specifically this year when we implemented because it has enabled my team to focus on a probably more complex different like solution designs in the back end about data modeling advancements in machine learning and AI or some like data engineering specific processes that's where you need to like really put your your whole attention and has delegated the other more um, simple relatively simple activities of creating a dashboard like uh, analyzing a piece of data uh, you know identifying insights into other people that uh, with uh, like without the necessity to have like too many technical skills, they have been able to like leverage all of the data that is being fitted to them, right? And one very important thing here is that you know it's not just about delegating and them doing the job for the sake of you know like um, delegating activities. The other reason why the data champions role is key is because it is them who will have actually a better understanding of their uh, of their domain and it is them who will actually be able to spot and identify you know the insights in an easier way when they are doing the analysis with their own hands with an with a like self-service tool right sometimes that's always a challenge for data teams like trying to be experts on everything we cannot be unfortunately experts on everything we need to have like domain knowledge that's true to communicate effectively but we also need to acknowledge that people within uh, the specific areas will always have an advantage on that and you know it is them who is, is going to be uh, kind of like pushing the insights forward in, in an easier way so yeah again has been effective because it has enabled uh, my team to focus on like uh, specific complex projects and it has enabled uh, uh, at this moment uh, at around 70 percent of the areas to be um you know to be more data driven oh that's fantastic. That's an incredible result you've been able to achieve. Could you expand more on uh, managing data teams effectively? 
I'm specifically interested to know your thoughts on the interaction between data teams and proper engagement to deliver long-term impact. Yes, um, I have always been very aware that the workload for any data team in any company in industry will be endless, right? And you might apply the same concept for, for other teams, right? But um, the expectations, specifically in an area like data, where it is um, it is a need, or it has become a need for uh, like for all the departments itself, like would always be there to be as agile as possible, right? So uh, what I identify sometimes in like different teams when I'm speaking with like other leaders is the amount of time that they have had to, like that they normally have to spend in ad hoc requirements. You know, curiosity will be in the mind of everyone asking like questions about what is going on with the business and how can I answer that from the data, right? So therefore, um, you know, you will have endless number of questions coming to you if you just open the channel to be like, bring on your questions and we're going to answer them with data. You know, that's just like, it's like saying, I have water and who is thirsty? Everyone will be thirsty for, um, um, you know, for more knowledge, right? So um, there has to be some uh, kind of like framework that you can put in place to 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 avoid like uh, you know drowning your team into these kind of ad hoc requests, right? First of all, is the understanding of what is ad hoc and why sometimes ad hoc is bad for everyone, uh, yeah, like for the requester and for the team uh, answering those questions, right? First of all, like you need to go through the assumption that everyone who is asking a question not always will come. Uh, with the complete understanding of why they're asking that question, right? And you will, you might need to get into kind of like a deep conversation to actually find out the specific reason why they asked that and whether it's a valid question or not, right? So you need to kind of like try to set in every conversation you have like the barriers about like uh, uh, trying to validate whether it's a, a valid question uh, that they have, right? With that assumption that not all of the docs are beneficial and not all of the docs are actually valid, you can actually kind of like try to uh, time box or like set a specific proportion of your effort that you should or can spend on it, right? Your effort should mainly be focused on enabling the business to move forward, right? not on answering just questions from the past. And the way you're going to enable it is by building more like technology that is going to be more self service for them, right? Technology that is going to be reusable, scalable, and repeatable, right? So so um, one of the, uh, you know, one of the main focus that you should have is uh, on the development of, um, you know, technology for enablement. So having consider that and having also considered that ad hoc requests are not always valid, you know, what I try to do, you know, in most of the teams that I work is try to set a percentage of work of about 70% to be allocated for development and only 10% allocated to ad hoc, right? It's a drastic thing, but it has proved to be kind of, an, uh, for me at least, an effective balance on which putting that restriction on ad hoc has make the requesters to put their eyes on how do you, I transform these ad hoc requests into development for them, right? And that's where they start the conversations about like, okay, I have this question, but uh, this is a question that I will probably have uh, constantly every quarter in the future, and why don't we build a specific product that will enable me to answer those questions in the long term and maybe do some more like a forecasting or like a more detailed analysis of that, right? So you change your mindset, like because they know that there is a restriction, and then they know that you just want to work on with your vision in the future. There is, uh, you know, that that that's definitely just like not stopping them to ask for requests just for the sake of, uh, you know, you being stubborn and not wanting to take a docs. It's just simply changing their mindset of like what will be beneficial for you and the business in the long term. 
So we talk about 70% of development and, and 10% of the doc. There's another 20, uh, 20% uh, there that it's always healthy to leave for any kind of like run activities, right? Unfortunately, like, you know, you will, it will be almost impossible to stop activities such as like boxes that are like the uh, boxes that you find in the pipeline, like specific issues that you find on a daily basis with uh, new data sources you're, that you're onboarding uh, or process that have specific technical depth. But you need to have a lower balance of like at least 20% to like for your team to work on that like day to day like BAU activities like to 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 keep your pipeline healthy right so with that 70 20 10 percent i think from from my experience um i have enabled my team to focus on more like on a project based uh like to have a more project based oriented um mindset and I think, well, I don't think, I mean, based on feedback, it has also been beneficial for them to understand their, their career development in a better way, right? Uh, some of the, like what some feedback I have heard is like when they work only in building adult developments on day to day, it's like a monotonous uh, activity that, you know, doesn't create sense a sense of direction to them. And they just feel like they are just in a repetitive work, uh, workload that doesn't like go anywhere right whereas if you focus on the product development with the vision of the future collaborating with stakeholders for something that they are going to use continuously that's going to definitely create like more of a sense of of personal development for their career so yeah i, I think that's that's the balance i've been working on as we wrap up today one final question i have for you especially as you're the vp of data what has your experience been with data teams when they look at becoming experts in different areas? What has the result been for your team specifically? Uh, as an example, um, attention B, we have a specific le entry level, which we call the beekeepers, uh, which is um, basically um, the function that provides customer service to like all our customer base and uh, that in the beginning in the beginning it just starts as a like you know service oriented role where the key skills are to understand how the business works and how and what is the the value that our pensions are providing to our customers right by developing that they immediately become someone that has an understanding on how specific areas of the business might have uh, an impact, right? So someone can start there and can understand how our marketing campaigns have impact our customers because they have been talking with the customers and understanding, you know, why they were they attracted to our products. Or someone can be there and like develop an interest in on the software development of our products because they understand our platforms has been very useful for them, right? If they have that interest, you know, we have opened the opportunities for them to develop their career in the other areas, in junior roles, regardless of the background that they have, no matter whether they have studied or not studied, you know, there is, I can tell you countless examples, our head of product, um, our like, like multiple software, like senior engineers, uh, marketing managers, um, like, uh, you know, countless examples of people like have been a pension before for like four to five years maybe and they have developed their career there right so yeah we do have that belief we give the opportunity and it has worked successfully right like for them developing a career and for us understanding like uh you know giving the opportunity to them definitely has a better impact in in our departments how that has impact um you know uh, the data department is specific first of all the communication and collaboration with other departments, it's very easy because, again, everyone understands each other because not everyone, but like a lot of the people will have experience in other departments and will know like to think like others, right? So therefore, it's easier for them to understand the data. It's easier for them to communicate about like what they have seen in the data. 
rather than being in silos and like not having an understanding of like how finance works, how marketing works, how product works. Uh, and number two, um, in terms of like internal recruitment for our team, um, we are at the moment actually like thinking about onboarding our like the first perform uh, like the first person in the data team from like uh, from an internal recruitment. And we know, like, I'm not worried about, like, oh, would I find talent or not? I'm just, like, I know that we have, like, a, a talent of, like, very diverse people that we just need to train. And it's going to be effective, right? Well, you've now been handed the blueprint of Data Bridges by Master Builder Lewis. By using his insights and wisdom, you too should be able to build the Data Bridges and be the architect of your own success. And you can connect with him on LinkedIn for further insights from him. And if you enjoyed this, you'll really enjoy our episode with Darren Wood as we explore new strategies to propel your career forward by unimaginable leaps. It's something you can't afford to miss. I also really want to thank Amplitude for their partnership in creating this episode. And from me, Ross Webb, until next time, bye for now.